I was a very cynical person during my teen years. I had a tendency of being overly critical about pretty much everything around me. You can say that negativity consumed me. I guess I thought I'd stand out if I hated stuff that others liked just for the sake of being different. Thankfully, I like to think that I've mellowed out over the years. <laughs> Fuck you, Donkey Kong! And that's led me to re-examine certain games that I used to absolutely despise. Today, I want to talk about one of those games and how I was pleasantly surprised. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword is an odd game. It seemed as if it was doomed to be divisive from the start. From the long development time, the frequent arguments and disagreements behind the scenes between series veterans Shigeru Miyamoto and Eiji Aonuma over the game's direction, structure, and controls, to the frankly embarrassing first reveal of the game's motion controls at E3 2010, it was understandable to be at least cautiously optimistic. At first, it seemed like Nintendo struck a gold again. The Wii's brand new 3D Zelda was receiving a claim that hadn't been seen from Zelda since Ocarina of Time in 1998. Reviewers were calling it perfect, a masterpiece, the best Zelda game ever made. But it's as if every passing year that praise dwindled to the point that all that was left was disdain and hatred. Now you'd hear many of those same reviewers saying that Skyward Sword has too many tutorials, Skyward Sword's controls are broken, Skyward Sword is repetitive, Skyward Sword is too long, Skyward Sword is too linear. Skyward Sword is a bad Zelda game. I think Skyward Sword was the first time that I was actively counting down the days until a game launched. I watched the trailers over and over again and eagerly anticipated any kind of new info in the newest Nintendo week. You guys remember this show? Just thinking about it makes me all nostalgic. When Skyward Sword finally came out, I dragged my dad to the store with enough money to buy it and the Wii Motion Plus add-on. It was Thanksgiving break, so I had all the time in the world, and I was enjoying the game. Some of it. I had recently played through Ocarina of Time 3D, and something just felt off about Skyward Sword. I was liking the graphics, music, and story, but when I was actually playing the game, something about it was... underwhelming. Then I got to Lanayru Desert and this stupid ass quicksand section that I just couldn't get past. After a few days this area visually and mentally bored me to the point that I put the game down, and I usually never did that as a kid. One or two years must have gone by before I gave it another chance. This time I was determined to keep going until I reached the end. I did not like Skyward Sword. In fact, I hated it for the reasons that I went through earlier. At this point, I had already played mostly every other big Zelda game from the NES original to Twilight Princess. What was supposed to be Link's grandest adventure ended up being a big disappointment. Fast forward a couple years and now suddenly everyone loves Skyward Sword. The HD remaster released for the Switch was to blame for this shift in opinion. Suddenly, people were touting Skyward Sword as this misunderstood Zelda game that it was actually great all along. I mean, really? Did the HD remaster really do enough to fix the game's flaws, or is there really a case to be made that Skyward Sword was never actually a bad Zelda game? I wasn't planning on getting this game, I had made up my mind from the day it was revealed, especially not for $60 when I had already paid full price for the original. Ultimately, I couldn't help it. Curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to find out if I could actually like, maybe even love, this game. After 10 years since I first played it, these are my thoughts on The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. I mentioned that one of the few things that I legitimately liked when I first played the game was the story. By the way, this is your story spoiler warning. I'll give you 3 seconds. Link's got a nice ass. Skyward Sword is the earliest point in the Zelda timeline and serves as an origin story of sorts for everything in every other Zelda game. There's this almighty power and some asshole practically destroys the entire world trying to obtain it. The goddess Hylia yeets the Triforce to the sky, hides it in a rock, and sends the remaining human survivors to live atop said rock while she and her troops of all other non-human races successfully seal the Demon King away. Thousands of years later, that outcrop of land in the sky is now a lovely town called Skyloft, where the humans live happily and the surface world is no more than a myth, a story of fiction in the minds of all residents in the sky. 
What's not fiction is that it's the day of the Skyloft Knight Academy exam. This handsome anime dude here named Link is one of the participants, but before he can prove he is worthy of being a knight, all sorts of wacky shenanigans ensue, like getting rudely woken up thanks to his best friend Zelda, getting scolded by his best friend Zelda, getting pushed off the edge of Skyloft and nearly killed by his best friend Zelda, getting pushed again by his best friend. Zelda's kind of an asshole. Oh, who am I kidding? I love Zelda. Oh yeah, Link also keeps having dreams about the end times, probably not important. What is important is passing that night test with the help of his trusty Loftwing, a species of giant bird sent by the goddess herself to serve as humanity's companions and guardians. Not helping is this lovable head of hair named Groose. We like Groose. End of discussion. Of course, Link passes the exam, and after a near-death experience, he and Zelda go on a peaceful ride through the sky. Oh, hi, Tornado. Oh, bye, Zelda. Link wakes up in his room, but unfortunately, it wasn't a dream. As he has to explain to Zelda's father, Headmaster Gaipora, Zelda is still out there. Gaipora tells Link to rest until morning since it's too dangerous to go alone. But when Link hears a voice in the academy hallway and checks to investigate, he sees the blue woman from his dreams and follows her inside the statue of the goddess. The woman introduces herself as Phi, a servant of the goddess Hylia and the spirit of the sword that rests in front of Link. She explains that his strange dreams and Zelda's disappearance happening around the same time is no coincidence. They are signs that it is time for the two of them to begin a grand mission prophesied by Hylia. Link is the goddess's chosen hero, destined to travel to the surface and prevent the coming apocalypse. With a shiny new sword in hand, a Peter Pan cosplay, a personal mission to reunite with his childhood friend, and a uh, Fi, I guess, Link begins his long, long adventure. Along the way, he meets a nice old lady in a temple, and a not-so-nice younger lady named Impa who scolds Link for taking so long that he forced her to intervene to save Zelda from getting captured. Probably shouldn't have been fucking around to impress the Lumpy Pumpkin's owner's daughter, huh, Link? Link also meets the best character in this game that isn't named Groose, Girahim. The demon lord Girahim is the demon king's loyal servant, responsible for the tornado that took Zelda away from us all in the hopes of using her to revive his master. Girahim is an excellent recurring villain. He has an unforgettable personality, can be downright creepy and terrifying with how he nonchalantly describes the gruesome ways he wishes to see Link die, and is also a big fan of Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> But hold up, what was that about using Zelda to resurrect the devil or some shit? Hey Zelda, can you explain? Psych! Link, have my harp! Oh, okay. No, but wait, let me come with you. No, you can't. You still have 20 hours of game time left. See ya. So Link goes back to the temple where the nice old lady was and is like... Now what? She explains that Zelda and Impa went through a door called the Gate of Time. So they have time traveled to the past to avoid Girahim and... Have a sleepover, I don't know. Point is, Link has to rendezvous with them using another gate of time. Oh, look at that, it's right here, how convenient. What's not convenient is how it's sealed, and the only way to break the seal is with a skyward strike from the goddess sword. But it's too weak right now. You know what that means. Time to copy the Wind Waker and power up the goddess sword. Oh yeah, Groose is here too. Say hi, Groose. So Link defeats this beast called the Imprisoned after it breaks from its seal in the temple grounds. Hope that's the last time we fight him. And acquire the three sacred flames to power up his sword. Back at the temple, oh the Imprisoned escaped again. Good thing Groose here built the Grusinator to fight him off. How can anyone not love this man? With Link and Groose working together, the beast is sealed yet again. Hope that's the last time we fight him. Link manages to open the gate of time and travels to when Zelda and Impa are waiting for him. It's here that Zelda drops a... A whole lot of information on the poor kid. Zelda reveals her role in the legend as the mortal reincarnation of the goddess Hylia. This whole adventure has been a part of Hylia's plan to destroy the Demon King, whose name is revealed to be Demise. Very subtle there. All the obstacles that Link has had to overcome have been part of a test to prove if he has a spirit worthy of harnessing the power of the Triforce to end the threat of Demise once and for all. Zelda, using her new god powers, blesses the goddess sword once more and it takes its final form, the Master Sword, the Blade of Evil's Bane, which is really goddamn long in this game. Makes the Master Sword from Ocarina of Time look like a cheap knockoff. To Link's dismay, Zelda reveals that she must enter a deep sleep to keep Demise at bay until he can find the Triforce. The way that Link reacts to this news, how he tries to stop Zelda from doing this after traveling all this way to reunite with her, is now one of my favorite emotional moments in the entire Zelda series. These two were just kids living their normal, peaceful lives and were thrust into this prophecy without much of a choice. It's heartbreaking, and it makes the player want to succeed even more, not just to save the world, but so these two can be back together again. 
back to their old lives with their new buddy Groose, who I'm not kidding is the best character in this story. I don't just say that for the sake of a meme or something. He starts off as the stereotypical bully, jealous of how much time Link and Zelda spend together. When he follows Link to the surface for the first time, his ego and main character syndrome are so exaggerated that he acts like a spoiled brat after learning that Link is the one destined to save Zelda. But this discovery is what makes him grow and develop, it's the reality check that he needed. While he may not be the one doing all the cool sword fighting out in the field, he manages to find a way to make himself useful. He pulls his own weight and reaches the point where he respects Link and is willing to do everything in his power to help him bring their friend back home. I'd go as far as to say that Groose is my favorite character in any Zelda game, period. And this Link and this Zelda are also some of the best versions of their characters. Let's wrap things up, after fighting the Imprisoned for the third time- okay, this is getting old- and gathering parts of a melody known as the Song of the Hero that's set to reveal the location of the Triforce, Link and Fi find where it is, inside a dungeon right beneath the goddess statue in Skyloft. I like how it all comes full circle, you start off on Skyloft and your final destination is Skyloft. After assembling the Triforce of Wisdom, Power, and Courage, Link wishes for the Demise of Demise. So the piece of landmass that the goddess statue rests upon falls toward the surface world just in time to bonk this bitch on the head before we have to fight him a fourth time. The world is saved, the demon king is no more, meaning that Zelda can wake up from her multiple thousand year long nap. Everyone is celebrating, peace has been achieved, and this marks the end of Skyward Sword. <laughs> Girahim makes a surprise comeback, claiming that he can still revive Demise in the past and plans to do so now that he has Zelda in his clutches. Back in the past, Girahim does everything in his power to stop Link and… he succeeds. Demise is resurrected and Girahim reveals his true form as the spirit of the Demon King's sword, much like how Fai is the spirit of the Chosen Hero sword. I thought that was pretty clever. Gruus comes in to take Zelda to safety, leaving Link and Demise to battle it out, and ultimately, Link comes out on top. But Demise is a sore loser. He places a curse just before fading away, promising that his future incarnations will forever terrorize those holding the spirits of the hero and the goddess. This is basically here to explain why there are different versions of Link, Zelda, and Ganon in a bunch of other Zelda games. Link returns back to the temple where Zelda, Groose, and Impa await. Fai tells Link that her duty as the chosen hero's guide has been fulfilled, and it is now necessary for her to sleep within the Master Sword for all eternity. Now, this here is my biggest gripe with Skyward Sword's narrative. This is supposed to be an emotional goodbye, but Fai never develops much of a real character for me to get attached to. Not counting a few moments of sass, by the end, Fai means nothing to me. By making her behave and talk like a lifeless robot for the whole game, this goodbye fails to get an emotional response out of me. Aside from maybe a bit of sympathy for Link since at least he seems to care, Fai is no Midna, no King of Red Lions, no Tattle, she's pretty much on the same level as Navi to me, who I also don't really care for, and this brings down what would have otherwise been a touching scene. Well anyways, Link puts the Master Sword and Fai to rest. Zelda and Impa have their own heartfelt goodbye, but their friendship was largely developed off screen so again, my investment in this little moment is near non-existent. Zelda gives Impa one of her bracelets to remember her by, Impa swears that they will meet again someday, and when the three kids arrive back in the present, we see the old woman waiting for them with the bracelet. Even in my first playthrough I knew that the old woman was an old Impa. The hair and the Sheikah eye tear on her face gave it away. Since we did spend more time with this version of her this goodbye, was a bit more impactful. A post credit scene reveals that the surface world is now known about to I'm assuming everyone back in Skyloft. Friends are reunited, father and daughter are reunited, couples are reunited, cause come on, they're a couple. Zelda tells Link that she wants to stay on the surface and asks him what his plans are. Link smiles with those big ass lips of his, the camera pans toward the sky, and that's the end of Skyward Sword. I don't know how many people actually asked for the explanations that Skyward Sword gives us for why things are the way that they are in this series like the birth of the Master Sword, the origin of the Triforce, how the conflict between Link, Zelda, and Ganon first began, but I am really glad that these ideas were made into a game nonetheless. That's not to say that it's perfect because holy shit it is not. There's definitely a lot of contrivances, some of the characters' roles and actions frustrate me to no end. I'm sure there's plenty of plot holes due to the time travel that the story focuses on in the latter half, but I don't care. 
because I am invested in most of these characters and this premise so much that, while they don't make the flaws go away, they become easier to forget about and ignore. This game could have really benefited from some voice acting though. Maybe not for every cutscene, but this is one of the chattier Zelda games in the franchise. There's a lot of reading, is what I'm getting at, and while I can still tell what the characters are feeling from their mannerisms and anime grunts, I would have liked to hear them speak every once in a while. Silent characters is a tradition that I'm glad Breath of the Wild did away with, and while the voice acting there can certainly use some work, I'd rather have it than not have it, as long as it's good enough. While I'm a big fan of this story, it unfortunately suffers from some pacing issues because of how the core game is structured. Zelda 1 was not the first adventure game ever made, but it certainly popularized the genre with its endearing setting, secrets, and sense of freedom. Not counting some locations that required a specific item to access, there wasn't much stopping you from going wherever you wanted to in the original game. Over the years, the Zelda series has strayed further and further away from this design philosophy. Until 2017, Zelda 1 is honestly the only game that was like this. It was the release of Skyward Sword when most agreed that Zelda had gone too far. Even when I'm not talking about Metroid, it seems like I can't escape this discussion of linearity versus non-linearity, can I? Skyward Sword is extremely railroaded and handholdy. You're pretty much always told where to go. Puzzles, while some are certainly clever, aren't all too brain taxing. The game's map is more segmented than it's ever been, with the closest thing resembling an open world being the sky. And it's a far cry even when compared to Wind Waker's Great Sea. There isn't much to do here. Getting to the surface world may as well be a level select screen. You can't just walk from Farron Woods to Elden Volcano. You have to leave Farron Woods by going back to the sky and fly towards the opening in the sky that leads to the volcano area. Even within these regions, you are restricted to a few sub areas at a time. It's rare to come across wide open spaces and when you do, your objective is still noticeably straightforward. The game was trashed to hell and back because of this back in the day. Because of the state that Zelda used to be in. The formula that Ocarina of Time made mainstream was becoming stale. People wanted Zelda to grow up. But instead, Skyward Sword felt like more of a regression than anything Aonuma and the rest of the Zelda team had previously given us. This is what turned me off from the game the most. I found the super linear structure and the VTuber breathing down my neck 24-7 to be boring and insulting. Also keep in mind that Skyward Sword released the same year as Skyrim, and while the Elder Scrolls and Zelda are two very different franchises, it was hard not to make comparisons back when they came out. Skyrim had a seamless open world, where the possibilities of what you were able to do in it felt endless. In contrast, it's no wonder that fans only grew to resent Skyward Sword for not even attempting to make that next big generational leap. But then Zelda got its own Skyrim with the release of Breath of the Wild. This is the game that people wanted. Something that harkened back to Zelda's NES roots and revolutionized the gaming industry yet again. Now that we have Breath of the Wild, is Skyward Sword's more focused design actually a bad thing? No. People like me only saw it as a bad thing because we were sick of Zelda's refusal to change, while everyone else was striving to be more ambitious than the competition. Skyward Sword I think suffered more than anything from the timing of its release, and the reception the HD remaster has gotten is proof of that. If we're being real here, the HD version doesn't change a whole lot of the core experience. The game now runs at 1080p 60fps, but other than that, the visuals remain intact. The text is snappier, skippable cutscenes are no longer locked behind hard mode, though I don't understand why hard mode couldn't have just been made available from the get-go. The controls have been fine-tuned a bit and now you can opt out of the motion controls entirely, though I have a bit more to say about that later. There's added camera control, auto-saving, item descriptions aren't reset and regurgitated to you every time you boot up the game, and Fi and other tutorial-related aspects have been reworked to be largely optional. It's not exactly consistent, but still a big improvement over the original regardless. While these are all very welcome and make this the better version of Skyward Sword overall, I don't think they're enough to change the minds of those who didn't like the game back on the Wii unless their only issues were any of the things that I listed. It's still the same Skyward Sword at the end of the day. Still linear, map is still segmented into three big chunks plus the sky, the sequence of events haven't been tweaked at all so there is still plenty of required backtracking, so if you still think you'd have a big issue with all that, Skyward Sword HD likely won't change your mind. The point I'm trying to make is that the remaster didn't change my opinion of this game. Time and a new perspective and outlook did. 
I can't say this with 100% certainty because I didn't revisit the Wii version for this video, but if I only replayed that version I still think most of my points in this video would be the same. Now I can appreciate the advantages that Skyward Sword's compact structure brings. Breath of the Wild sacrificed story, character development, not including Zelda, unique and well-crafted dungeons, and some technical stuff like performance for unparalleled freedom. Skyward Sword does each of those things better than most other Zelda games because of its focus design. Dungeons especially, man, I miss traditional dungeons so much. For all the things that Breath of the Wild does really well, the shrines and divine beasts leave a lot to be desired, easily the biggest letdown of that game to me. I didn't appreciate Skyward Sword's dungeons nearly as much as I should have back then. These are tied with Twilight Princess and A Link Between Worlds as some of the most fun levels in the series history. The Skyview and Earth temples are pretty basic, but they're the first two temples in the game, I wasn't expecting anything exceptional. The Lanayru mining facility is the beginning of the game's streak of well-made dungeons not just because of the interesting puzzles, gimmicks, and means of progression, but the settings play a big part too. There's this one that takes place in a mining facility, and another one is straight up a pirate ship. The Ancient Cistern is my favorite of the bunch. Even though it's technically a water temple, it's not a boar like Ocarina of Time's water temple. Although lately I've been seeing people defend that water temple, so saying that might be controversial, but I don't care, you can't please everybody. It's got a pleasing aesthetic and a tense set piece where you have to escape these zombie but goblin enemies. Now this has stuck with me since my first playthrough. After the Earth Temple, I think the weakest dungeon is the Fire Sanctuary, and even then, I still think it's pretty fun. Unfortunately, the gimmick of going underground makes it a little too slow for my liking. And Skykeep, although it may lack its own visual identity since the rooms all borrow assets from previous dungeons, it makes up for it with its unique mechanic of being able to rearrange the room layouts to create a path to the pieces of the Triforce. I think Skyward Sword is the only 3D Zelda game that doesn't have a single dungeon that I dread having to go through again. It's got some really high highs and the lows are just alright. And because of how the overworld is designed, even the parts of the game where you aren't dungeon crawling still sort of feel like dungeon crawling. You've got objectives to complete, trinkets to collect, and puzzles to solve before you can proceed to the next area. Unfortunately, these sections aren't always that enjoyable to play. Since Link revisits the three major regions, them being Farron Woods, Elden Volcano, and Lanayru Desert several times for plot purposes, that means you have to come back to these three regions quite frequently. It can get very repetitive, and this was another one of my biggest issues with the game back then. Looking at it now, it's... it's... it's fine. The good thing is that most times you aren't literally retracing your steps. So while the first visit to Lanayru confined you to the mining and desert sections of the region, the second visit takes place mainly in the Lanayru Sea that you travel through using a boat powered by a timeshift stone that also conveniently transforms the sea of sand into a beautiful ocean. Honestly, the timeshift gimmick of Lanayru makes this the best region by far, and it's the only region that doesn't suffer from over-repetition since you're always seeing something new. And the last visit has you going on a quest to revive a dead dragon, what more can you ask for? Unfortunately, I can't say the same thing for Farron Woods and Elden Volcano. So the second visit of Farron Woods does technically take you somewhere you haven't been to yet, but Lake Floria is an extremely small chunk of the level. Its main purpose is to serve as the tissue connecting the woods to the ancient cistern and the water dragon Farron's domain. And Farron... Farron... What a bitch. In the second visit, she forces you to go through the Skyview Temple a second time to get some magic water that will heal her wounds. And in return, she opens up the way to the Ancient Cistern. Okay, story-wise, whatever, I'll let it slide. Gameplay-wise, what a bore. Going through the first dungeon again is lame, nothing of value is added. If they wanted to have a fetch quest here, they should have made Lake Floria an area with actual substance so we wouldn't have to go back to a place we already visited. And the third visit when you have to get her part of the Song of the Hero, not only did she flood the woods as revenge against the monsters causing trouble while also destroying the homes of the innocent inhabitants, way to go Farron. But then she won't give you her part of the song until you prove yourself by painstakingly collecting these tadtone things. Like, what the fuck? I saved your life, I have the true Master Sword on my back, blessed by Hylia herself, and you still think I'm unworthy? This is padding at its absolute worst, and Elden Volcano is not much better.
The last part of the second visit is an escort mission. Who are you escorting? This prick here, Scrapper. His two personality traits being he doesn't like Link and he simps for Fi. You gotta lead him all the way to the fire sanctuary and you start at the very bottom of the mountain. It's a hike that you've already done technically twice by this point. And the third visit is just there. It's a stealth segment, but there's no new gameplay mechanic to make it a good stealth segment. Let me snap people's necks, I don't give a shit. All your items are missing, and you'd think you'd have some freedom in how you can approach this challenge. Maybe going for a certain item first will unlock a route that you wouldn't have access to if you got some other item first. But no, as far as I know, it's as linear as linear can get. These feel like a waste of time. For as much as I've grown to admire Skyward Sword, these parts still suck. The good thing is that they're pretty short, all things considered, but yeah, it would have been nice if this game didn't rely on retreading old ground so much. Everything else about the overworld though is really good. Again, Laneru Desert, excluding this stupid ass quicksand and the one too many mini dungeons you need to complete to find the sand ship, is brilliant, and everything else about Farron Woods and Elden Volcano is enjoyable. And I like exploring every nook and cranny for secrets and collectibles. This being an action-adventure game, when you aren't adventuring, you're getting into some action, and this is yet another divisive thing about Skyward Sword, the swordplay. The motion-controlled combat has been talked about to death by so many others. Some hate it, some love it, I really like it. Can it make the strategies for winning most of the fights practically the same? Yup. Is it unique and satisfying and a cool way of controlling an action game that I'd like to see attempted again? Absolutely. Skyward Sword wouldn't be Skyward Sword without the motion controls. The HD remaster thoughtfully added a completely separate control method that uses buttons exclusively. I tried it out for a bit and... Yeah, it works, it's fine, I can see why some would prefer it, but not me. To me it feels unnatural, some actions require you to input odd button combinations. Other actions feel like they should be mapped differently. The motion controls are much more intuitive in my opinion, and it sucks that you can't combine the two control schemes. So if you like swinging the Joy-Cons when fighting enemies but not so much for swimming and flying, Tough shit, best you can do is just switch to whatever option you want at a given time, but that isn't very convenient now, is it? I still stuck with the motion controls, and if you haven't played the game but plan to, I recommend at least giving them a try. However, this is also the reason why I hesitate in calling the HD version the definitive version of Skyward Sword. Take this point with a grain of salt because, again, I didn't go back to try the Wii original for this video, but call me crazy, I think the Wii Motion Plus is a better fit for Skyward Sword than the Joy-Cons. The motion controls have personally never bothered me. I don't remember ever having to recalibrate my Wii Remote, not counting when the game first booted up. On the Switch, I'm assuming because of the lack of a sensor bar to give the system an idea of the controller's position at all times, I had to recalibrate this son of a bitch constantly. The Joy-Con's extra sensitivity makes it not as consistent as playing with the Wii Motion Plus did. Again, based on what I remember. When it's correctly calibrated, it works exceptionally well. Aiming items like the bow and claw shots is extremely quick and fluid. Unfortunately, to keep it calibrated, a lot of my playtime was filled with... Speaking of items, Skyward Sword has some pretty sweet items. They're not all winners. The Gus Bellows kinda blows. The whip has some cool applications, sad that it is criminally underused outside of the ancient cistern, after which it becomes another situational Zelda item. The traditional items though are all pretty much the best they've ever been. The slingshot, claw shots, and bow all benefit from the excellent gyro aiming, and the bow has this really nice quick draw feature, where you use both Joy-Cons to mimic the motion of pulling an actual bowstring. Your bow becomes a lethal sniper rifle used for killing enemies and pumpkins. Bombs saw the biggest improvement. Not only can you refill your bomb bag with bomb flowers you find on the ground, but there's these added visual throwing arcs to help gauge where your bomb is going to land. Or if you don't want to throw a bomb, you can roll a bomb. It's a great offensive option and is also required for some simple puzzles. Last major item first introduced in Skyward Sword is the Beetle. Unlike the Gust Bellows and the Whip, the Beetle remains one of your most vital tools throughout your whole adventure. There's almost always a use for this thing, such as grabbing all sorts of out of reach items and my favorite use case, making it your very own aerial bomber. And while it starts off really slow, you can eventually upgrade it to a much faster and more durable beetle through crafting. Yes, there's crafting in this game. Nowhere near as littered with options as Breath of the Wild, but this was a new thing for Zelda, and for the most part, it's not too bad. Most of your main items can be upgraded, along with a few smaller items like bomb bags and arrow quivers to allow them to hold more ammo. 
Each upgrade requires a select number of crafting collectibles you can obtain through various methods. A few of these can be pretty rare, so keep an eye out in case they're plastered around the overworld or hidden in treasure chests so you don't have to deal with some of the more tedious and unconventional methods of obtaining them. This is also where you repair your shield because Skyward Sword also introduced a durability stat. Just for shields though, and if you master the shield bash which isn't very hard to do, you won't really need to worry about them breaking. Your adventure pouch is where you store your shields and other items of lesser importance. To my knowledge, this was the first Zelda game to really emphasize a limited inventory. You start off with 4 pouch slots and it maxes out at 8. It helps that this is one of the easiest Zelda games ever made, so I rarely ever need stuff like potions or ammo expansions anyway. But it doesn't make it any less annoying when I have to stop by the item check to swap out my wooden shield for my iron shield when I'm headed to the volcano for example, or when I want to use different metals that can make stuff like rupees or bugs spawn more often. Oh yeah, you have a bug net for catching bugs and other small creatures? They're just used to upgrade potions. I hardly use potions, so I hardly upgrade my potions. Moving on. And there's the usual pieces of hearts that give you a full heart container when you collect four of them. A lot of them can be found in these goddess chests located all throughout the sky, but they only activate after you hit their respective goddess cubes on the surface with a skyward strike. Say it with me, why the fuck? Just have the chest on the surface or don't lock it at all. The rest of the pieces of heart can be found through standard exploration, playing mini games, or completing the various side quests Skyward Sword contains. Majora's Mask will probably always be the side quest champion of the Zelda series, but I'd say that Skyward Sword is a close third behind Breath of the Wild. Side quests get kicked off when you meet this fellow chap here named Batro, a friendly monster who wishes to turn into a human to live life as a Skyloft resident. He claims that gratitude crystals will help his dream come true. You get these crystals either at night just… lying around, okay or by helping others with their problems. Even though a good chunk of them don't go further than the standard fetch quest, it feels good helping these folks out. Skyloft doesn't quite reach the heights of Clockdown, which truly felt like a lived-in community, as everyone had their own schedules and routines they followed during Majora's 3-day cycle. But I'd argue that this is a good effort. I couldn't help but get immersed in this town during this playthrough. I was drawn to these people, just trying to live ordinary lives and facing ordinary problems, like raising an infant while having a full-time job, unrequited love, although this is a quest that I found to be more uncomfortable than fun, being too lazy to clean your damn house like oh my god woman, my non-existent allergies are acting up just looking at this place, trying to get fit and resorting to steroids, and running out of toilet paper, my worst nightmare. It's kind of dumb when doing fetch quests you're not allowed to douse for more than one lost item at once though, and some of these minigames can seriously fuck off. Like this pumpkin archery game, this circus diving game where trying to go for the heart piece makes me want to commit clown murder, and this game where you have to carry a bunch of pumpkins. What the hell is it with this game and pumpkins? This harp minigame is alright though. Now listen as I play the song of my people. Together we can show the world what we can do. The bug hunt? Don't, don't, don't do the bug hunt. This isn't really a side quest, but you can also participate in a boss rush near the end of the game for cash prizes, a piece of heart, and one of the coolest rewards, the Hylian Shield. It's a shame that you get it so late, but just getting to have this and the Master Sword in the last few cutscenes is all the reward I need. It's so freaking cool. And it has unlimited durability, which I can't even say about Breath of the Wild's Hylian Shield. Anyways, I guess the last big thing I want to talk about is the boss fights. This is another one of Skyward Sword's greatest strengths, though unlike the dungeons, there's a few bosses that I straight up am not a fan of. Skaldera is just King Dodongo 2.0, although he makes for a memorable set piece in the Earth Temple. Moldorok is so piss easy he gets demoted to mini boss during the second visit to Lineru Desert. Tentalus is and the imprisoned. Why do they make us fight it three times? And why are the second and third encounters like barely an hour apart from each other? On its own, it's alright, the fight has spectacle going for it. You just have to fight him too many times, even more times if you're going for 100% because you will no doubt run into him during the boss rush. As for the other bosses, these are some good Zelda bosses. Well, this guy's weakness isn't much more creative than Ursula over there, but this fight makes up for it by being the only boss fight that involves your Loftwing. Everything else involving the Loftwing is mediocre at best. It's simply too slow and I am shocked that its speed wasn't tweaked for the remaster. Uh, sorry, got off topic there. I just like how different this fight is from the others, and it's not every day you can say you performed an exorcism on a giant sky whale. Kalaktos, outstanding battle. Great use of the whip to dismember him, great use of his own weapons to dismember him. Overall, a great day for fans of dismemberment. 
Girahim is as enjoyable to face as he is to watch. Just a good old fashioned one on one sword fight that tests your reflexes like nothing else. And although you also face him three times like the imprisoned, each encounter is different enough and don't happen so close to each other that it isn't really a problem to me. I like how as he grows more unhinged in the cutscenes, his fighting style gets much more aggressive. It's also to get you ready for the final battle against Demise. This fight is fucking rad. It can sadly be broken quite easily because of the shield bash and he doesn't have much health so if you know what you're doing, this fight will only last a minute or two. Doesn't mean I don't absolutely love the setting, the music, the way the Skyward Strike is implemented, and the flashy overkill finishing blow. An epic end to an epic tale. There's a lot to like about Skyward Sword. It's got great dungeons, some pretty great boss fights, an interesting story, superb visuals and music, like, wow. I would have appreciated more than just an upres and increased frame rate, of course. But let's be real here. Skyward Sword wasn't in a desperate need for a visual overhaul the likes of Ocarina or Majora 3D. It has a timeless art style and it just looks beautiful. And since this was originally a celebration of Zelda's 25th anniversary, they got a full orchestra for the soundtrack and it plays a huge role in my enjoyment of this game. I value music so highly in single player story focused games and Skyward Sword delivers and then some. The credits theme, the song that's currently playing in the background, is glorious. But there's also a lot to dislike about Skyward Sword. I still think it's a bit too long for its own good. I still think many of the revisits are unnecessary and in some cases straight up bad. Some of the remaster changes aren't exactly 100% perfect. Like I mentioned, Fai's tutorials are largely optional now, but there are still occasions where she will repeat information that you just learned. Also, there's the fact that a feature that allows you to return to the sky from anywhere on the surface instead of only being able to using bird statues is locked behind a $25 amiibo. That's dumb. I'm aware it's not a huge feature, I didn't exactly come across a time where I really needed it. And you can save yourself a headache over the price and stock issues by buying one of those NFC cards instead. But it's the principle of the thing. Should have been in the game, no amiibo required. Skyward Sword could have been a masterpiece, but it's not. It still has plenty of imperfections and neither the passage of time nor the remaster were able to magically fix them all. But I'll tell you what they did do. They gave me and countless others an excuse to give the game a second chance. To look at it through a new lens in a post Breath of the Wild world. Skyward Sword was never a bad game. Its flaws are not big enough to outweigh the many things it does right. It just came out at the wrong time. I wasn't ready to appreciate it for what it was 10 years ago. Instead, I hated it for what it wasn't, and I'm glad that's no longer how I look at the game. Because of this new perspective, I was able to notice things like, wait, this intro isn't anywhere near as bad as I remember, and wow, the cutscene direction is really well done for a Wii game. And why did I despise the Silent Realm so much? The Tears of Light from Twilight Princess are infinitely worse. These barely even last 10 minutes. Never mind, screw this, screw this, screw this. I know that Breath of the Wild's enormous popularity means that we may never get another 3D Zelda game structured like Ocarina, Majora, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, or Skyward Sword, but gosh, I... I hope I'm wrong about that. Because there's still merit in making a more focused, linear, 3D Zelda adventure. And I thank my latest playthrough of Skyward Sword for helping me discover a newfound appreciation for this style of Zelda. Until next time, be safe, take care, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you for watching.